This lecture in Climate and Earth 401 will be on the centrifugal force. The lecture will follow the Holton and Hakim text, and it requires understanding the previous lectures on rotating coordinate systems, and it would benefit from understanding the lecture on angular momentum, which talks in more detail about the breakdown of motion into a rotating coordinate system. Centrifugal force is one of the apparent forces, we call it, and it's apparent because it's a force that is dependent upon the coordinate system in which you are observing the motion and describing the motion. The centrifugal force is pretty intuitive to many people, and it's often illustrated by having, say, a ball on a string or or some mass on a string that you're rotating around over your head. And if you were to, say, let the end of the string that's in your hand go, then the ball would continue on in a straight line once it is not constrained by that force pulling it towards your hand as you spin it. Another classic example is that many of the rides in a carnival will be dependent upon centrifugal force in order to, say, provide their thrill or, or the entertainment, as is shown in this ride here, which is circling and people are hanging in chairs on steel cables, and as it spins, you lift up and move into a plane that's more nearly parallel with the rotating disc that's holding the chairs. When we say it's apparent, it depends on the coordinate system in which you are in, and the other apparent force that we will spend a lot of attention on, really more attention on, will be the Coriolis force, which is related to the rotation of the Earth. We'll go back to the circle basics, and this is a polar coordinate system. And in this coordinate system, this is two-dimensional. If it were Cartesian, this would be the x direction. This would be the y direction. But we're going to have, at the origin here, we're going to have that it's rotating. It's rotating with angular velocity omega. In a particular amount of time, it rotates through an angle theta here, like this. So the parcel that we're thinking about, or the mass that we're thinking about, is out here, and it moves from here to here. So omega is equal to d theta dt. And the arc length, s here, that the distance that the object moves through is equal to r times the angle theta here. So that's basic geometry. So the actual magnitude of the velocity is going to be equal to ds dt. So how fast does this arc length change with time? Where we've used this bracketed notation here to represent the magnitude of a vector. If we were to look at the velocity here at this point, the tangential velocity is in this direction at this point and the tangential velocity is in this direction at this point. And what I've done here is to take this vector that was at the first point, moved it here so that we can see explicitly there is a delta v. There is a change in velocity. So if there is a dv dt, then we are seeing an acceleration of some sort that is related to a force of some sort. And in this case, that is the centrifugal force and sometimes also the centripetal acceleration. Mathematically, the change in velocity per unit time, which will be related to the acceleration, will be the magnitude of the velocity times the change in the angle per unit time times what is essentially here, is, is the direction of the r vector. The magnitude of r remains the same, but the direction of r is changing as you say go from here to here. So the angular speed is, again, here, the magnitude of the velocity is omega r. 
The centrifugal force for our purposes then, or dv dt, is equal to minus the magnitude of the velocity vector, d theta dt, the angular velocity, times this r vector here. So this is r, and this is the magnitude of r. So this is essentially just giving us the direction pointing towards the origin, the axis of rotation. And we get, using these definitions here of omega is d theta dt, magnitude of v is equal to omega r to say that the dv dt, the acceleration, is equal to minus omega squared r. Now we're going to think about the Earth. The preceding was a schematic to get us comfortable with this idea of a rotating coordinate system and to introduce this centrifugal acceleration problem. We used that rotating coordinate system with radius r, and we are now going to move into a similar coordinate system, but it is anchored in the realities of a model of the spherical Earth. Therefore, the r vector here, you need to pay attention to the details, is different than the r vector we're about to see as we move into the Earth's coordinate system. So we'll take this as a representation of a spherical Earth, so it's really three-dimensional. The Earth is rotating with angular velocity big omega around its polar axis, so this is the North Pole, this would be the South Pole. When we think about this, the relevant radius is along this axis. And this is a place I will say that people often get confused because you think about the radius of the Earth, but the radius of the Earth is being measured from, say, the center of the Earth here like that. And therefore, the axis of rotation from which we get the centrifugal force is going to be along this axis here. We're going to start by thinking a little bit about gravity. What direction does gravity point? Well, gravity is pointing towards the center of the Earth, and it's going to be pointing in a local vertical downwards, and the distance from the center of the Earth, the Earth's radius, is going to be the important radius for calculating the gravitational force. And you might recall that gravity has a 1 over r squared relationship. Therefore, as you move away from the center of the Earth, the gravitational force decreases as 1 over the square of the radius of the Earth. So that's faster than, say, something that would be linear, which would be 1 over r. So the force per unit mass from gravity, and again, I can refer you to the lectures on gravity, is minus g naught times a squared over a plus z squared times, again, a vector r over r here like that, where the r over r here is pointing down here along the radius of the Earth toward the center of the Earth. So what direction does the centrifugal force point? If we go back to here, then the centrifugal force associated with this point on the surface of the Earth due only to the rotation of the Earth is going to be equal to omega squared r. And it's going to be pointing outwards directly from its axis of rotation, which is here. If we look at the local vertical, which is pointing straight up from that point on the surface of the Earth, then here is the direction, here is the coordinate that is important for the representation of the gravity. And hence, there is a component of the Earth's centrifugal force here that is in that local vertical, and that would therefore add or subtract, the idea being a sum here, it would combine with the gravity to essentially alter the gravitational force. There's also a component 
that's in the xy plane and it's pointing really towards the equator which is represented by this little arrow here on top of this coordinate system arrow. So we're now going to explicitly consider a coordinate system tangent to the Earth's surface. There is a lecture on the tangential coordinate system which I refer you to. This is a very important concept to get is our frame of reference and our coordinate system because there is an accounting that is going to be required and that's always going to depend on the coordinate system and things like calculating the vector components and getting your sines and cosines and your relationships between the different coordinate systems properly accounted for. So the component that is in the same direction as the gravity will be a omega squared cosine squared the latitude phi. And there is a component pointing towards the equator, which is minus a omega squared cosine latitude sine latitude. So those are these two components here. And you get that by the recognition of that this r is going to be related to a, the radius of the Earth, times the cosine of the latitude. So here you're seeing the accounting going from a coordinate system centered on the radius of the Earth to a coordinate system centered on essentially the axis of rotation that you're seeing at your point on the surface where you were making your observations where you are setting up your frame and where you are going to be taking an accounting of your forces here. One of the things we do, one of the practices, is we're going to, rather than always be worrying explicitly about this centrifugal force here, the one in the direction of the gravity, a omega squared cosine squared latitude, um, we're going to redefine gravity by adding that centrifugal force and gravity together. And we are then going to modify the definition of g, the gravitational constant. The modification here is that essentially you are just combining these two things together here to give an altered gravitational constant that is related to the centrifugal force due to the rotation of the Earth, and you're taking advantage of the fact that omega and the radius of the Earth are, from this point of view, essentially constant, and therefore it's always having the same effect. Therefore, we will simplify the equations by assuming that it is a modification to the gravitational force. There is a component towards the equator. And this component, we also are not, in most circumstances, going to pay explicit attention to. Those who study the planet in different ways, those who study the angular momentum of the planet, they, they have to pay attention to these things. But one of the things that happens here from the component that's pointing toward the equator, since the Earth is itself somewhat elastic, it can deform, so the Earth bulges, and it's pretty well known that the Earth has a bulge at the equator and is flattened a little bit at the poles, hence it's not a perfect sphere. And this becomes important as the quantitative aspects of your calculations get more and more precise. However, from the point of view of understanding the basic motions and the dynamics of the atmosphere, we will usually assume that the Earth is spherical. And because of this, this compensation from the bulge of the Earth, we usually don't consider the horizontal component of the centrifugal force explicitly. So what we've done is we've taken some time here to think about this force, derive quantitative expression for it, or at least a good model that represents it to a very good approximation.
And then, because of the geometry of the Earth, because of the modification of gravity, we are not going to consider it explicitly. That's summarized here. The vertical component is incorporated into a redefinition of gravity. We usually don't consider the horizontal component because the Earth has bulged to compensate for this force. And hence, in the equation of motions, centrifugal force often does not explicitly appear. Nonetheless, this is a very important force and it's a very important concept because we will, in fact, consider centrifugal force as we analyze specific dynamical features. Therefore, it's worth going back to the basic definitions of force and frames of reference and this idea of an apparent force and that force is dependent on one's frame of reference. The frame of reference that we choose is completely within our power and we usually choose a frame of reference to make a problem easier to understand and perhaps to make it easy to solve. And one of the things that might be viewed as confusing is as we choose different frames of references, if we think about forces in an absolute sense, the quantitative description indeed has to be the same from all these different frames of references, which again gets us back to the need for what we might call careful accounting in order to make sure, say, that budgets of momentum, budgets of energy, budgets of mass add up and are satisfied as required by the conservation principle. So there are many places where we might have some intuitive knowledge of, say, centrifugal force. If we go back to our simple polar coordinate system where we had something out here rotating around the center with an angular velocity omega and think about planetary orbits, then we can put the sun here in the middle. We have rotation around the sun. We can say that this is the Earth. And in this case, gravity would be essentially that string that you would have if you were rotating a ball around your head. And it's gravitational force it's pulling it towards the sun. As the Earth goes from this point to this point, then we have our delta V. Hence, we have an acceleration. Hence, we get back to the force associated with gravity. This is often an intuitive example because very often when we first learn about forces and when much of the work on calculus and early physics was done, it was people trying to explain the motion of the heavenly bodies and in particular the planets. And it led to the development of this concept of forces, conservation of momentum, and it also led to the development of calculus to do things like relate changes in velocity over a change in time, so delta V delta T becoming acceleration. From a very practical point of view, there are many places that we will need to be thinking about centrifugal force in dynamics. Here is a hurricane, and I took the liberty of drawing a coordinate system that's centered on the eye of the hurricane. There's rotation around that eye. Here might be the X and the Y, but here is a radial coordinate system with different radiuses coming around. And hence, you can see if you wanted to describe the forces in here from the coordinate system that is a polar coordinate system centered on the hurricane, you could conceive of this as a pressure gradient force bringing things in towards the center. And the Coriolis force starts to, in this coordinate system, really is able to be described as a centrifugal force with the rotation around that eye. Similarly, if we go back to the image that I showed earlier in how dynamics organizes the atmosphere, we had these two cyclones. We can place a coordinate system essentially at the center of each of these cyclones and describe the motion of an air parcel around here. So if you think of this as a wave, as we will ultimately, then there is a centrifugal force based upon a coordinate system centered 
at a point where you can describe the flow as having curvature around a specific frame of reference. And then, of course, there's the idea of the tornado, where you'll have these very strong vortices. And again, you can interpret the force quantitatively in a frame of reference that this appears as a centrifugal force. That is the end of the introduction to the centrifugal force, where the idea of the rotation of the Earth has been used to introduce the centrifugal force associated with rotation, which modified the gravity and led to the bulge of the planet. And then, despite the fact that it usually is not considered in the equations of motion that we'll spend most of our time with, there are many examples in the atmosphere, hurricanes, tornadoes, cyclones, wave motions, in which the concept of centrifugal force will prove to be quite useful.